All right, Nehemiah 4. So where are we so far, Nehemiah? Hey, in case you don't know me, I'm, I'm Joel uh, Fisher, one of the elders. Um, Nehemiah, he was a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Uh, the, the story basically kicks off, and, and Nehemiah gets this news from one of his brothers. Uh, he, he comes and he gets asked, how are things going back in Jerusalem? And, and he gives them much bad news about what's going on in Jerusalem. Um, he, he immediately at that point, he turns to the Lord. He, he you know, he, he, it's not a matter of what do I do now? He turns to the Lord and he prays and he weeps and he fasts and he, and he, uh, and he repents on behalf of his people and he, he takes this news that he got and takes it to the Lord. At that, at that point, the Lord then opens the door for him with the king. The, the, the king is able to see the, the, you know, Nehemiah is doing his service as a cupbearer. The king is able to see something's not right with Nehemiah. He's obviously got a relatively close relationship. He can, he, he can tell that Nehemiah is not quite acting right. And so he tells Nehemiah to, um, he asks Nehemiah, what's, what's going on? Why, why are you sad? And Nehemiah kind of gives him, well, how could I be happy? How, I mean, what this this is happening to my people. So he, you know, the based on the, you know, the the response of taking it to the Lord, the Lord that opens up this opportunity in favor with the king. The king asks, "Well, what can I do? How can I help?" Um, and so Nehemiah then, hey, he's asking him, <laughs> "Go big or go home, right?" <laughs> he's, he's, so he asks, he, King asks, "What can I do?" Is it well? Maybe I can go back there. Maybe you can send me a letter to get me through everywhere. You know, while I'm asking, why don't you just at, tell your the keeper of your forest to just, you know, give me as much wood as I need to get my job done. And so king, the king does that. He, he, he grants him. Uh, God, God has already obviously answered Nehemiah's prayer in granting him favor with the king to go do what he needs to do to take care of his people, to take care of his his, his homeland uh, to take care of his city. Um, and Nehemiah, if, if, you, if you, one thing you, you pick up in Nehemiah reading each, each stage when, when he calls people to do anything, when he, when, he, when he discusses anything that's happened, it's always God will be there with us. The good hand of my God, because of the good hand of my God, the king granted these things. Because of the, he's, he's always pointing back to the Lord. He's always pointing back to what he's done. So that, that said, um, several months later, Nehemiah has traveled. He's gone. He's gone uh, to Jerusalem. He inspects the condition. Uh, one, some guy named San Sanballat uh, is not happy that anybody would even care about Jerusalem. He's it basically. I mean, it's, the text is basically, why would anybody even? You know, he's mad because somebody is considering Jerusalem. Somebody is considering the the welfare of Jerusalem. And so that, that made him mad. He's obviously not, not pleased with them. Sanballat's a, a Horonite. Why does this bother him? He uh, was of the people that God had told the Israelites to, to boot out of um, Canaan. Now, I don't know if he was part of the people who went, were, was booted out and came back in later, um, or whether or not he was part of the people who stayed, you know, never actually got booted out like they were supposed to. Anyway, there's there's a there's a a definite hard feeling. This is really loud. Is that too loud, Kev? Seems really loud to me. There's a definite hard feeling that Sanballat has towards the Jews. He's he is he wants nothing good to have. Doesn't want them to even have a place to live. Doesn't want them to be protected. Doesn't want the walls to be built. He's just greatly displeased. But Nehemiah ignored. He did, there, there was Sanballat mocking, uh, making fun of, and, and Nehemiah just ignored. He said he, he didn't even respond in kind. He went to the Lord again. This is a, this is a pattern that we see in Nehemiah's life. He, he went to the Lord. Um, and he, but, but not only did he go to the Lord, he go to the Lord... He went to the Lord and continued with his plans. It wasn't like, oh, no, I need to stop. Somebody's making fun of me. Somebody's coming against me. He went to the Lord and continued with the plans. 
And he called the Jews. After this, he called the Jews to rise up and build. Nehemiah encouraged the Jews that, that again, that, that God would make them successful, that God would help them to build, to do what they needed to do. God would protect them uh, if they would stand up and serve him. And so the Jews started to rebuild uh, and repair the gates and the walls. And we went through that with um, Carson a couple weeks ago about the different gates that were rebuilt and the kind of significance of those gates. And so they would, went through them, rebuilt the gates. And that's kind of where we, we pick up now in Nehemiah 4. But it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? He's... You can almost picture this scene. He, he's in front of this army, Sumerian army, and he's just mocking them. And you, I'm sure, I mean, the Sumerians are no friends. So I'm sure there's a, oh, of course they're weak. Of course they're foolish. Of course they're not going to do this. Oh. There, you can almost visualize this scene as, as, he, as he's just making fun of them. He's, he's heard this news. Uh, we, we aren't necessarily given the location of this. Was near, were they near? Did they march up there and the, you know, to where they were building and mock them there? Did they get, get a report somewhere else? They're, so we don't know, but obviously the news got back that they were being mocked um, and laughed at and, and uh, that, that Sanballat was not very happy at all. I just wanted to throw out as a, a, a reminder that people will mock us. They will. They'll mock you if you're doing anything good. Let's, let's, let's step out away from doing the Lord's work. If there's anything that you're doing that's useful or good or um, might build somebody else up, somebody's going to probably mock you for that. If nothing else, just to say, that's pointless. There's no point to do that. Um, but if you're serving the Lord, there's then that added spiritual battle of they're gonna they're gonna try to tear you down. They're they're gonna try to tell you there's no use. You're not good enough. Uh, you know what what are they gonna tr try to complete it today? What what are, I mean, the stones are burnt. I mean they, the, the stuff you're even working you're you're a you're a dork. You, I mean you're gonna try to do you're gonna try to serve the Lord. Mr. <laughs> Loser, you're right. I mean, so the, the material that you're going to try to serve the Lord with, you, they're going to mock that. The, you know, they're going to they're mock your ability to do anything. But it doesn't matter. Again, Nehemiah, what does Nehemiah do? He prays. He prays. He, he, he does not stop what he's doing. He recognizes he's doing this for the Lord, not the popularity of man, not the popularity of the enemy around there. He's serving the Lord. And Nehemiah ignored the, these foreigners that were in his land, and he continued to obey God, and he did what was right for his people. Uh, verse 4. I don't think I read 3. Now, now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, Whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall so basically, again, mocking, just mocking the, you know, their ability to build anything. If you've seen a fox, they're very light-footed. You know, you can't even build a wall that can hold a tiny little fox. I mean, what, even if you did something, it would it would fall apart. Verse four: Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads, and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity. And do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. 
Again, what do we see? Nehemiah turns to the Lord. He doesn't respond. He doesn't send them, whether they're there or not, doesn't send a messenger. Say, hey, we really are going to do this, and we got some people who can build, and whatever. Here's my degree in building. And I mean, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't respond. He just goes to the Lord and says, God, take care of them. <laughs> I mean, what am I going to do? I'm doing the best I can. You, I'm doing what you told me. Lord, it's yours to take care of. It's yours to deal with. It's your problem to deal with. That being said, he doesn't just pray and do nothing, right? And that's important. A lot of times I think we pray and do nothing. He prays and continues to serve. He prays and prepares his heart for battle. He doesn't initiate the battle, but he, he recognizes the battle may be thrust on him. I don't have a choice. Let me prepare. Romans twelve seventeen through 19. Repay no one evil for evil. Have, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Nehemiah displays that here in, you know what, it's a touchy situation. I'm going to hold my tongue and I'm going to go to the Lord, but also recognizes it may not be possible. And so I'm going to prepare my men to fight. I'm going to prepare my heart to fight. I'm going to prepare my, my people that, look, we're not going to instigate something, but we better be prepared. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. This is exactly what he's doing. He's saying, God, they're coming after this. They're trying to stop us. You, you do what needs to be done, Lord. We'll continue to serve. Verse 6. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. There's just something powerful about that verse to me. You know, and the 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 work of God and the leadership that Nehemiah brought that and the reality of the situation that stirred together the people had a mind to work there were dangers in their land their city their walls were broken down they knew they had work to do It's not unlike where we find ourselves in America right now. There's dangers in our land. We have no wall. We have work to do. Uh, you know, that's from a physical standpoint, but there's also, you know, recognize that as a believer. There's, there are many dangers to your faith. There are many dangers to your family. And we should not live in fear, but we should intentionally be preparing and doing things, uh, doing the work that is necessary to protect them, doing the work that is necessary to build them up to be protected and to, and to be able to fight on their own. We're not always there. We're not always able to guard and protect and, and uh, whatever, but, but as uh, fathers, as husbands, uh, as leaders in the church, it is our job to to help others be ready to fight, right? It's not just we need to make sure that we are equipping others to, to fight the battle on their own and not, not thinking that we're going to be the hero dad or the hero husband or the, you know, right? We need to be equipping others to fight the battle that's at hand. So at this point, they'd built the wall, the entire wall, halfway to the height it's supposed to be. And these people were motivated to work hard. They had a good leader. They, knew, they, knew they needed to get a job done, and they were working hard to do it. In verse 7, now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry 
Shocker, the perpetually, you know, perpetually outraged sand ballot. That doesn't, I mean, how much does that sound like our current environment, perpetually mad about something? You know, the, he, he, they, they, they said, we're going to build the wall. They started working on the wall. What, did, did he expect that they were just going to stop because they mocked him? Did they expect that, oh, you're still doing this. I told you not to. And, and that, but, but the reality is, guys, is that, that we have a tendency to be easily controlled by being mocked. That's the reality. He, he expected them to stop doing it because that's a very common human thing to, oh, I might be called a bad name. I might, you know, somebody might not agree with what I'm doing. Uh-oh. So we need to be careful that we are willing to do the hard thing regardless of being mocked. Willing to serve the Lord regardless of being mocked. Willing to protect our families. Willing to protect our people regardless of being mocked. Sen Ballot was angry once again. Shocker. Um, yeah. Let's go to eight, sir. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayers to God. Here it is again. Nevertheless, we made our prayers to God. And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing. They're beginning to get, get tired. They've been working day and night for months on end. This is hard labor. We're not talking, you know, <laughs> sitting at a computer clicking keys. We're talking hard labor for months on end, carrying, carrying heavy burdens. Uh, the strength of the laborers is failing. And there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. There's... You know, they've been busy building, not worried about cleaning yet. So there's all this garbage garbage around, not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, they will, they will neither know nor see anything till they come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them that they told us ten times, from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Um, I, I found that 12 to be an interesting verse. The, the Jews who dwelt among them. Were these guys already helping with the, the wall build? Or were they just kind of hanging out not helping? Or were they... Go ahead. Which one? Okay. That's too old. Anyway, um, that's actually stuck. I'm just messing. <laughs> Yeah. And that's, you know, th this, this, I was, you know, kind of, kind of conflicted on whether this verse was, was talking about that, somebody not there, or talking about some of the workers who happened to be there, a you know, family there, or we, I, honestly, I'm not sure. Um, but I thought it was interesting that they came and told us 10 times, came and told us. And this, I'll be completely honest, this is 
conjecture. Read it, you know, read it as you see. But what this, what, what sticks out to me in this, what it, what it seems to be to me, conjecture, but is that these people who are living, living out amongst these people, yes, they came to warn, but it almost seems like they came more to scare, to stop the work. Hey, they're coming, they're coming. Oh, they're coming. There's a lot of them. They're coming. And the reason I, the reason I take that is because is you, when you take it down a little bit further, it talks about, well, just, just because they knew about it, oh, we're not going to do it anymore. We're not going to attack anymore because they knew about it and they prepared for it. And so if these guys really had surrounded the whole area and really had a huge army, it didn't matter. They could have, they probably would have attacked anyway. All conjecture, I get it. I'm just, for me, that almost, that almost, and, and to me, it, it's, it's a, it's a reminder, a warning that those who you consider friends and may well be friends, be aware that they aren't always necessarily giving you the best advice. Sometimes they're, they can, if they're warning you to stop the work of the Lord, though they may be legitimately concerned for you, be, beware. And I, you know, again, I'm going to, I'm marking that up as conjecture. Is that, is that really what's going on here? I'm not sure, to be honest. But that's what kind of why the ten times, why the over, you know, why they were over and over again. And no matter what you're doing, they'll, they will be upon us. So, um, therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall, at the openings, and I set people according to their families, and their swords, and their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and, and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your wives, and your houses. Do not be afraid of them. There, there will there will be times where a battle seems overwhelming that it just doesn't seem like there's a possible win here right remember the Lord great and awesome so he gives that he, first he says Look up. Look up. There's hope. There's a win. Him plus anyone is a win, right? So there, there's, there's hope for a win. We're not necessarily guaranteed to win because it may not be the Lord's will that we win, but remember the Lord, great and awesome. So he, get, he, he, he takes their eyes up. But then he also takes his eyes and say, this is why you need to fight. Your family, your people, your nation, your house, your sons, your daughters, your wives. You should be fighting, man. Fight for them. Fight for them. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. Again, we don't know how, how long was that, a day, a week, a month? The enemy figured out that we, they knew what was going on and were ready for it. So they just said, Rah, rather than take the losses, we'll go on. They weren't all that committed to, to stopping the work. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were, were, behind, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. And imagine this scene. I mean, they're, they're busily building this wall, and you've got some guy holding two, sh two spears and two shields, and right next to the guy that's building, and they probably switch off, and they switch off, and they, they're building, and they're looking, and, they're, and they're, they're taking care of what needs to be done to fight for their brethren, their sons, their daughters, their wives, and their houses. It would be much easier to probably just give up and go somewhere else. But they didn't do that. They fought. They worked. They continued to serve the Lord. 
So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah, those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens, loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction, and the other hand they held a weapon. And I'm, you know, you try to try to view how they're doing this. They're carrying large stones around. Which is probably the, the bulk of the burden that needs to be carried is these large stones, timber from the, timber from the forest. Sure, it'd be handy to have two hands, but instead they're carrying a sword. They've rigged up something else. That, that what comes into my mind is this is like carrying a casket. You know, they've, you know guys, six guys carrying a casket on either side. Like they've rigged something up. You know, they've got their sword. Work would be much easier without an enemy. <laughs> Wouldn't it? The work would be much easier without an enemy. But we have an enemy. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction, at the other hand they held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Then I said to the nobles and the rulers and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Again, he speaks to the people. Again, he has a plan. Man we're, man, we're busy. We're tired. We're far away. There's no way that we can hold a particular location. Guys, come running if you hear the trumpet. But don't worry. But don't worry. Our God will fight for us. Again, here you see that combination between believing and trusting wholeheartedly in God and also fighting and having a plan. And those are hand in hand, men. Those are hand in hand. We must understand that we should be fighting and having a plan and also trusting wholeheartedly in God. God's got this. He doesn't need us. He'll fight for us. But we still need to be prepared. So we labor work. And half the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, Let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. I think the, the point he's making here is even though he was leading the group, even though he was in leadership and, you know, probably many would be fine with luxury, he was not relaxing. He was not, you know, he was in the battle as well. And he was fighting, he was leading by being in the mix, not being, miss, not missing. Uh, I think that's, that's important. Um, I, I find myself often... as leaders that we are intentional, intentional about being involved in our kids' lives, involved in our wives, not just, you know, ignoring your wife until it's bedtime or, you know, 
<laughs> whatever. It's we should be intentional building that relationship. There there should be a bond that's that's uh, being built, and it's the, the the world, our own flesh, your wife's flesh, your kids' flesh, is constantly trying to tear that relationship apart. That's what it was just working towards tearing that apart, and so it's got to be intentional. It's got to be, and it, if not us, then who? We must be intentional to to take the lead in building those relationships. Take the lead in in uh, washing your wife with the water of the word. Take the lead in you know bringing your kids through scripture. Take the lead in you know stupid things. Show, showing your son how to how to work on an engine, showing your daughter how to do this, showing you things that build those relationships. We should be intentional about those um, because if our kids, if our kids who love us, know us, and we've built respect with them see us serving the Lord, the likelihood of them serving the Lord is much higher than if we've just been some authority figure in their life that comes home and yells at the end of the day. Guilty as anybody of that, for sure. But just um, be aware of that. Same thing with your wife. If you know, you've know you been pretty much absent or absent-minded thinking about everything else, and now it's bedtime and you want to cuddle or <laughs> cuddle. But we'll, uh, <laughs> you know, we need to be aware that, you know, your wife's desire to serve the Lord is also going to be affected by how well you pour into her, how much, how well you love her. And that's, you know, a call to each of us. There's a, you know, this, this Nehemiah 4 has been a very good reminder to me about where we are as a nation. For one, it's very, they're building a wall <laughs> to protect to protect themselves, that's, you know, we're building a wall. There, you know, there's many foreigners in their land. There are many foreigners in our land that don't have good intent for us. How do we react? We go to the Lord. We, we, we seek Him and we work hard. And we lead our families. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these men. I thank you for your Nehemiah. I thank you, God, for the example he set. Lord, I thank you, God, for the record that we got out of it. Um, Lord, help us to be men who, who, in spite of whatever comes up, we first go to you. We first uh, seek you rather than react um, so that we can be people of action rather than reaction. Lord, help us to be men who, who don't shy away from first leading ourselves and also leading our families and Lord, also leading where you've called us. God, I thank you for these guys. I ask you, Lord, to bless them. In Jesus' name, amen.